Really good to be here today and to see all of you here. Um, all year, we've been talking about what I call relevant issues. We've talked about dozens of different things throughout the year that are stuff that we need to know about right here in the here and now. It's stuff that confronts us on a daily basis. It's stuff that comes out in the news all around us, and we sometimes don't even recognize what that's all about and how that it is kind of unfolding um, God's plan for the age and indicators that Jesus is coming back maybe sooner than what many of us think. And, and so we've talked about a lot of the things over the last several weeks. Um, you know, we took a break and celebrated some other things, but over the last several weeks, we have looked at several things that, that are indicators uh, that we are getting closer and closer to the time when Jesus is going to come back again. Um, and we've kind of tried to set that in the context of those events that are going to take place as this age winds up and Jesus comes back again and the new age begins. And um, we, we, t we've talked about the fact that there's going to be the church age, which is what we're in now, and then there's the tribulation period, the two and three and a half year segments of the tribulation period. We talked about Jesus coming back right in the middle of that. We talked about the judgment of believers. We've talked about the judgment of non-believers. We've talked about um, the battle of Armageddon. We've talked about the, the fact that there's going to be a thousand-year kingdom of Jesus right here on this earth called the millennial kingdom. Uh, we just talked about a lot of stuff. Today, we're going to talk about one more thing, and that is what I call the judgment of nations. Oftentimes, when we as Christians read through our New Testament and we read about a judgment, we always assume, at least a lot of the time, we assume that it's always a judgment of individual people, and there are two of those kind of judgments. There's a judgment of individual believers and a judgment of individual non-believers, but there is also, as we will see today, a judgment of nations. And the basis of that judgment is how did the nations relate to God's chosen nation, the nation of Israel? And so we're going to look at that. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25. We're going to start in verses 31 and 32 of Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to look at this judgment of nations. This is what Matthew wrote. And actually he is, um, he is quoting something that Jesus said. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and the Son of Man is often what Jesus called himself, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations, I want you to get that, not all the individuals, but all the what? All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. Let's just pray and ask God to help us understand what that's all about. Father, I thank you because you're good and you're kind and you're gracious and you've given us your word. You have preserved it down through the ages when tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the blood of those who believe it. You've still preserved it. We have multiple copies of it available to us today in almost every language that is spoken, almost every, plan, every nation on the planet, your word of God is there. And so, Father, I pray that today you'd send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and teach us from your word what you want us to know in this hour. I ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake, and amen. And so those verses that we just read from Matthew's gospel clearly state that there is going to be a judgment of the nations. It says, all the nations will be gathered before him, and then he'll separate them one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. That's pretty clearly a judgment of nations. At the close of that tribulation period, that period of time that's divided into two, three and a half year periods, it's called Jacob's trouble, it's called um, great tribulation, it's called all kinds of things in scripture, but here we have it. At the close of the tribulation period, just before Jesus comes back and establishes his thousand year millennial kingdom, then he's going to summon all the nations before his throne for judgment. This judgment of nations has long been predicted by the prophets. This is nothing new. Even though most Christians in the world today don't understand it, don't even think about it, it's nothing new. It was predicted by the prophets centuries ago back in the Old Testament. Let me give you a for example, Joel. The ancient prophet Joel of the Old Testament, he described this judgment of nations when he wrote the words of Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He wrote, Behold, in those days and at that time, I will bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, has God done that? 
The Jews were carried away into captivity, first to Assyria, later to Babylon. What has God done? Hasn't he brought them back? And the Jews are again in their homeland, the nation of Israel, uh, that was reestablished at the end of World War II in 1948 when Great Britain signed the Bellflower Mandate, establishing an official nation of Israel again. And God has brought Jews back there, just like he says here. He'll bring them back again to Judah and Jerusalem. And then look, I will also gather all nations. He's going to gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is a huge valley right in the center of today's nation of Israel. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have also divided up my land. What does God say there? I'm going to bring them into judgment in the valley of Jehoshaphat. All the nations are going to be brought there. And what's going to be the basis of the judgment? How have they treated my people, the children of Israel? How have they treated the Jews? They have scattered them from their homeland. They have divided up the land that I gave them. They have done all of that. And so God says, I'm going to bring them there and I'm going to judge them for that. This judgment of nations will be conducted by the Lord Jesus in the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Zephaniah, also an Old Testament prophet, predicted this judgment of nations. This is what he wrote in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse number 8. He wrote this, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms and to pour out my indignation, my anger, my wrath, my indignation, all my fierce anger. So what is God saying there? I'm going to bring the nations together, and what am I going to do? I'm going to pour out my indignation on them. I'm going to judge them on the basis of how they have treated my people. God has already made the determination to judge the nations. You see, the nations of the world will be judged on the basis of how they treated the nation of Israel. God said through the pen of the prophet Joel, in Joel chapter 3, verse number 2, I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people. It's on the basis of how we treated Israel. I'm going to do that on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided up my land. Now, you know, in, in this world that we live in today, there's this, there's this Middle East problem, the politicians call it. There's always conflict going on in the Middle East. And what that's actually talking about is a conflict between the Arab nations that surround Israel and Israel itself. I got to help you understand this now. A lot of the land that God says they have divided up my land, this land that I gave to the nation of Israel, a lot of that land is the land that is today occupied by these, these Arab nations, by these Muslim nations that surround the nation of Israel. And God doesn't like the fact that these foreigners have come into his land and have divided his land up instead of Israel possessing that land. But you know what God promises them? And we don't have time to get into this today. But one of these days... The nation of Israel is going to occupy every piece of real estate where Abraham walked. And that's a great big chunk of real estate. Israel is eventually going to conquer her neighbors and she will occupy all that land. God says this to Abraham way back early in human history. God was speaking to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. This is what he said to Abraham. He said, get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Now I want to show you here what he says to Abraham. He says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What did God say to Abraham and his descendants there? This nation that he was going to make from the descendants of Abraham. What did he say to them? I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. I want you to understand that. A nation is either blessed or a nation is cursed based on how they treat 
the nation of Israel? Are you an ally to the nation of Israel? Are you an enemy to the nation of Israel? Just study world history and you will find emphatically that every nation that has ever opposed the nation of Israel, every nation that has ever fought against them, every nation that has ever occupied them, every nation that has ever conquered them and oppressed them and abused them and mistreated them, that nation fell into the rubble of human history. You can go back to the Egyptians, to the Romans, to the Greeks, to the Babylonians, to the Assyrians, every major world empire that ever opposed the nation of Israel. God judged them, God cursed them, and they are no longer any significant nation in the world today. Do you get that? Do you know what that means to us as red-blooded Americans? It means we need to be very concerned about who it is that's in charge of America's foreign policy today. We need to be very concerned about who our congressmen and our senators are on the national level that are making the determination about what our country is going to do in regard to the nation of Israel. Fortunately, from the founding fathers on, we have always been pro-Israeli in our American foreign policy, but there have been times when some not-so-informed politicians have been in power, and they have not been as devoted to the nation of Israel as we should be. And I want you to understand, if we ever step over the line of becoming an enemy of Israel, we will come under the curse of God as a nation, because he said, I will bless those who bless you, and what will I do? I'll curse him who curses you. And so it's imperative that we understand. I want to tell you, one of the biggest questions that ought to be on our minds when we vote, and I realize we voted last Tuesday, but we'll be voting again in 2016. I mean, excuse me, 2020. What we need to be doing is we need to be asking this question of everybody that we're going to vote for. What is your stand on the nation of Israel? Are you pro-Israeli or are you anti-Israeli? Are you, are you in favor of the Palestinians being given some of their land? Or are you in favor of Israel occupying the land that she has and then maybe under our breath and getting more of it because God says she's going to get more of it? Do you understand that? Those are questions that we ought to be asking uh, based on Scripture and based on what God says about this judgment of nations. So you see the judgment of nations at which God will either bless or curse the nations on the basis of their treatment of Israel will be God's final fulfillment of that covenant promise that he made to Abraham way back there in the book of Genesis. Now let's talk about, let's talk about sheep nations and goat nations. You know, in those verses that we read in the very beginning, he said he's going to separate these nations like a shepherd separates his sheep from his goats. And so let's talk about that. When Jesus returns to earth to establish this thousand-year kingdom right here on earth, he will seat himself on his throne and gather all of the nations before himself to determine which nations receive the privilege of entering his kingdom and which nations will be immediately sent to eternal damnation. I want to give you this now. By the time that this happens, the tribulation period is over. Nations have survived. There have been some people in nations on the planet that have actually survived the atrocities and the holocaust of the tribulation period under the reign of terror of the Antichrist, the man of sin. And so these nations are still intact. But then Jesus calls the nations before him. And he's about to determine which nations get to go intact into his kingdom. And the basis is going to be determined by how did you treat my people? How did you treat the Israelis? Those nations who treated the Israelis well will get to enter into the kingdom still intact. Those unbelievers who survived the tribulation period get to go into the kingdom intact. But those who were anti-Israeli immediately go into eternal judgment, eternal damnation. Because remember, they're, they're all unbelievers at this point because the rapture's already taken place and the believers have already been raptured away. But let me show you how, how this, how this is, is said in Scripture. Jesus said it like this, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 34, and then down in verse 41. He said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. So there's Jesus sitting on his throne, and nations, not individuals, but nations are gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats 
on the left. Get that? Now, I want to tell you this, and we'll be able to see this as we go further through here. The sheep are the nations that have been pro-Israeli. The sheep are the nations that have been supportive and allied themselves with the nation of Israel. The goat nations are the nations who have been anti-Israeli, enemies of the people of God. And so he says that here. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And then, and then look at this. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, these are those nations that have been pro-Israeli, friends of Israel. Look at what he says. Come. How does he describe them? You blessed of my father. Why are they blessed? Because they were friends of Israel. Because according to the promise that God made Abraham back in the book of Genesis, what will I do? I will bless who? Those who bless you. Any nation who is a blessing to the nation of Israel is going to be on the right hand of God in this judgment of nations as a sheep nation, and they will be blessed of the Father. And look at what the blessing is. Look at the form of the blessing. Look at the next phrase. He said, come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What kingdom is he talking about? He's talking about that kingdom that he is about to establish right here on planet Earth. The tribulation period is over. The unbeliever, I mean, the believers have already been judged. Unbelievers are still here. They have survived, many of them. The tribulation period, now God's going to judge those nations that they're in, and he's going to determine which nations get to go into his 1,000-year kingdom right here on planet Earth. So here's why it's so important that a nation be pro-Israeli. Even though the rapture's already taken place and everybody left here at that time are unbelievers, once they go into the kingdom, if they're permitted to go into the kingdom, and those people in those nations at that time, still in physical bodies, go into the kingdom as nations, they have a thousand years. Guess what's going to happen during those thousand years? They're going to reproduce. There's going to be at least ten more generations of people and during that thousand-year kingdom, those who, who recognize that Jesus really is the Messiah, that he really is the blessed one of God, those people will be saved, and those people will, will, will get to participate in, in, in the, the rulership of that kingdom. But those who do not believe, even though Jesus is here and the word of God is going out from Jerusalem and all the things that are, are true about that kingdom time, even though that's true, some of them will still not believe. But you've got nations that have another 10 generations or so with an opportunity for their people to be saved. Saved. Do you get that? But what about the nations who are anti-Israeli? Let's read about what happens to those goat nations. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, these are the goats, these are the ones that were anti-Israeli, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So what happens to these nations that are anti-Israeli at the end of the tribulation period before the thousand-year kingdom starts? What happens to those nations? In mass, all the citizens of those nations are sent to hell at that moment. Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The factor that determines whether these nations are sheep nations and are blessed or goat nations and are cursed is their treatment of the nation of Israel. They are the national brethren, the national brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus. He was a Jew, just like they're Jews. He's Israeli, just like they are Israelis. He said to the sheep nations, he said this to them in, in Matthew 25, verses 34, or 35 through 40. This is what he said to the sheep nations. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, there are two interpretations of this, and I think both of them are valid. 
He could be speaking here to his disciples and saying, if you treated another Christian right, then, then, then you, know, you, you get this blessing. And, that's, and I think that's a valid interpretation. Aren't we supposed to treat God's people right in the sense of the Christian, the, the church? Absolutely. Isn't that why we have Freedom House? Isn't that why we have Matthew 25 House and we're going to have Proverbs 31 House and we have the food pantry and clothes closet? Because we are responsible um, for the well-being of as many people as we can be responsible for. Yeah, that's true. But if you read the context here, there's a huge possibility here that he's not only talking about Christians, that he may be in a very specific sense talking about the nation of Israel who are his brethren in the physical, biological sense. He was a Jew, and they are Jews. And so you see, if that's true, what he's saying here is that it's crucially important that we treat Israeli people, especially the Israeli nation, the way uh, God would want us to treat them and be an ally with them. Because then he says to the goat nations, he says to the others, he said, I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. And you did not take me in naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them saying, As surely, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. You get that? Maybe he's talking about Christians. He could also be talking about the nation of Israel. I think he's probably talking about both because both are his people. When Jesus returns with his saints to establish his millennial kingdom, the citizens of the sheep nations who survived the tribulation period will be given the privilege of being part of that kingdom. That's what Jesus said to those sheep nations. He said, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. Step into this kingdom that I've come back to prepare. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Unfortunately, when Jesus returns with his saints to establish his millennial kingdom, the citizens of those goat nations, those people who survived the tribulation period, and our anti-Israeli will be immediately sent into eternal punishment. Jesus said to those goat nations, Depart from me, you cursed, into what? Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, at the judgment of nations, all opposition to King Jesus from the nations will be eliminated. The battle of Armageddon has just been fought. Their armies have been destroyed. All opposition to King Jesus and his new kingdom will have been eliminated. And God is going to judge the nations and determine which ones get to go into that kingdom. Their anti-Jewish leaders, along with their military forces, will have been destroyed at the battle of Armageddon. And a new political order is about to be launched. A global government under the control of Jesus and his people. I used to kind of laugh. How many of you are um, old enough to be aware of political things when, um, when George Bush number one was president? He, he made this phrase popular. Remember what he said? He started talking about a new world order. Remember that? Let me ask you this. Three or four administrations have come and gone since then. Do we have a new world order? Absolutely not. This is still a broken, messed up place. There is no new world order. But I want to tell you this. When Jesus gets done with this judgment of nations and establishes his kingdom, there will be a new world order. All opposition to Israel, all opposition to King Jesus in his 1,000-year kingdom will have been put down, and there will indeed be a new world order. The redeemed in heaven describe it. When they sing to the Lord in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, you were slain, they're singing to Jesus, you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and look at this, and we shall reign, where? On earth. 
You see, there's a time when the people of God, the blood-bought saints of God, those who are redeemed by His blood, those who have been bought back from the slave market of sin and been given freedom under their new master, the Lord Jesus Christ, when those people are going to reign with Him on earth, the verse says. That's this kingdom. The redeemed and glorified bodies which they have already received at the resurrection of the righteous will be ruling over the unredeemed who have survived the tribulation period and are still in their earthly bodies. Talk about a new world order. That will certainly be one. I don't know about you, but I have trouble getting my mind wrapped around that. Some people still here in physical bodies. Some of the rest of us here in new bodies, glorified bodies that we got when we were raised from the dead and given these new bodies, and we're both here occupying planet Earth at the same time, and we're ruling over them. Talk about a new world order. That's going to be different. The curse of sin lifted, the, the lion laying down with the lamb, the child playing on the, on, the, on the nest of vipers without being bitten, nothing causing any kind of destruction, no war, no training for war. All the things that the Bible says are going to be the conditions of that thousand-year kingdom. Talk about a new world order. That's going to be it. I'm looking forward to that to see how that's all going to work out. Now let's do the conclusion. In order to serve with Christ in this 1,000-year global government that, that we call the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, and ultimately to serve him in his eternal government, because after the thousand years, guess what happens? There's a new heaven and a new earth, and the kingdom just rolls on forever and ever and ever. But in order for you to participate in any of that, you must be among those that he called in Revelation 5, 9, the redeemed. You were slain, and you have redeemed us to God. And we're priests and kings, and we're going to get to serve, uh, reign on earth with him. You must be among those that are classified as the redeemed those that have been bought back out of the slave market of sin by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, those that have believed the Jesus story. You've got to be among those. And the only way to be counted among the redeemed is to believe that the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, the sacrifice he made for us on the cross, and then the sacrifice he made for us when he went to hell in our place and stayed there for three days, is sufficient to cleanse us from all sin and make available to us the incredible gift of eternal life. 1 John 1 7 says this, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that's why the author of Hebrews wrote, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal, forever and ever and ever, redemption. He bought us back. How long did he buy us back for? forever. It is eternal redemption. That's Hebrews 9 and 12.